Thank you so much. Um, one, of the, one of the great things about doing what I'm able to do today uh, is that I get to run into and, and meet all kinds of fantastic people. And these two guys up here are two that I've only until today, till noon today, knew uh, as online personalities. Neil21, uh, all these little uh, you know, arguments back and forth, and, and I love that because it's that engagement. The, the reason I reached out to you when I knew we were going to be in the Northwest is because I respect the, the level of engagement that we have. Uh, Gord, you know, just the, the information that you've sent, there's a wonderful conversation taking place here. And it, it, it's kind of an epicenter of thought, and as someone who's plugged into uh, this kind of channel of thought going on around North America and really around the world, it, it's amazing how much of it emanates from here and the quality of that. Uh, I did say today, you know, I'm, I'm a farm boy from central Minnesota. What in the world am I going to tell people in this great city? Uh, you know, I had heard of Vancouver, obviously, before I came here, and, and people had said it's a, it's a fantastic place, it's a wonderful place. Uh, wow. Uh, nobody uh, oversold it to me at all. This, this is a wonderful place, and you truly do live in one of the continent's top three cities, in my opinion. This is an amazing place. So what I'm going to talk about tonight are, are some of the things that we're dealing with south of, south of here in crazy land. And, you know, I'm going to give you some examples from my hometown, and I hope that some of it can help inform you, uh, if not about what you're doing here, which, like I said, is very fantastic, uh, help you in some of the regional decisions and some of the other decisions you're making. Um, one last thing before I get going. In Minnesota, we have this thing we like to tell ourselves called Minnesota Nice. Uh, it's this sentiment that, and, and I, I don't know if it's true or not, perhaps it is, uh, that we're kind people, we, we're decent people, we uh, smile at each other when we pass on the street, we're, we're you know, in, in our introverted kind of way, uh, very, you know, kind and pleasant to each other. Uh, I have to say, every time I go north of the border, I, I, I feel like it's Canada nice. And I'm not saying that to patronize you, I said that today when we were walking around, uh, I really do feel a strong affinity here, and if there ever was a war that I got drafted in, I would have no problem being a draft dodger and coming to Canada and living among you because this is a, a, a beautiful place full of people who smile at you when you pass by on the street and say hello and hold the door for you and, and, and all those little things. So with that, let's get started. Uh, our organization, Strong Towns, is a, a nonprofit organization. Uh, our mission is to support a model of growth that allows America's towns to become financially strong and resilient. Uh, we use the word towns. Uh, I, we also use the word cities. Uh, we'll talk about counties or boroughs or parishes or, or, or provinces or whatever, whatever you want to talk about. What we're really uh, focusing in on here are local units of government. The, the very base units of government that we use to make decisions about our day-to-day -day lives. We could have called our organization Strong Local Units of Government. That would have been a really long web address. It wouldn't have stuck with you very long. So it's Strong Towns. If I go back and forth, just interpolate in your brain. There's three big takeaways from this presentation. Uh, I'm going to begin with this and end with this. Uh, and I hope these stick with you beyond tonight. The first is that the current path that cities are on is not financially stable. The second, the future for most cities is not going to resemble the recent past. And the third, the main determinant of future prosperity for cities will be the ability of local leaders to transform their communities. I want you to step way back, way, way back, and, and take a broad look at uh, the way we build our places. Uh, these are two artist renderings. The one on the left is an ancient city called Ur. This is the oldest place that we've ever excavated. It's in the Fertile Crescent. On the right is, of course, ancient Rome. When you look at these cities, what you're looking at here are civilizations that endured long enough to essentially become ruins, things that would endure to one degree or another to this day. And the layout and design of them uh, are, are very, very similar, largely because they were built around the transportation technology of the day, walking. We walked, and so when you look at cities that were built around the world in different cultures and different civilizations, they all tend to be scaled in a certain way. The distances between buildings, the differences between types of destinations, the way they would use buildings to frame space, the way they would place significant buildings at the end of views, 
uh, all the different things about how to build this place was kind of an evolutionary process that gave us cities like this. And you can even fast forward thousands of years to this place, which is my hometown back in the early 1900s, my hometown in central Minnesota, and you see the same basic layout and design. This was a city of people who walked, and it was scaled and built around people who walked using those techniques used for thousands and thousands of years. Beginning before uh, the Great Depression, and then kind of stalling out, but, but beginning again with a, a vigor after World War II, we began to build cities around the new transportation technology of the day, the automobile. Uh, we began to come up with different building styles, different building types, different ways of separating uses, uh, different ways of connecting them. Uh, these were, you know, uh, all brand new types of things that um, we were doing. And, and there's a narrative that we like to tell ourselves about this, uh, one of progress. We used to be a people that walked everywhere. Uh, and we built cities around people who walked. Now we are a people who drive everywhere, and we build cities around people who drive. Someday we'll have jet cars, and we'll build cities around people with jet cars, and someday we'll teleport to different locations, and our cities will look completely different than they do today, right? That's a very affirming narrative of who we are and what our recent history has been. There's another way to look at this, though, a way that isn't so affirming uh, of where we're at today. When you look at uh, these images, what you're seeing here is a pattern of development, a way of, a style of building that was developed through trial and error experimentation. And by the time you got to these cities, there were literally thousands of years prior to them of people trying different things, seeing what worked, copying what worked, discarding what didn't, and figuring out how to actually build places. And when you get to you know, a, a place like my hometown or a place like early Vancouver, and I've seen some of the photos of what this place looked like in its infancy, what you're looking at there is a pattern of building uh, that was time-tested over millennia. Regardless of the latitude, regardless of the culture, regardless of the continent, we were building places around people who walked and they looked very, very similar. When you look at the way we build today, the technology for doing this was not developed over a long period of time by trial and error iteration. They're based off of the theories of some very intelligent people, some deep intellectuals, who came up with the idea of Euclidean zoning and separation of uses and hierarchical road networks, arterials and collectors and what have you. And we just started building that way. We didn't test it out in Seattle first to see if it worked and then export it to other places. We just did it everywhere on a continental scale all at once. And so it's important as we go through this to have this conversation framed in a way that you understand that we are living through humanity's greatest ever social experiment. No one has tried to do what we have tried to do on the North American continent uh, to the size, scale, or degree that we've tried to do it. This is a huge, huge experiment, and in the course of history, it's a very, very young one. What we do with that Strong Towns is the, the intersection of land use transportation with finance. How do we build and how do we finance that growth? And how do we, those financial uh, decisions have implications over the long term? Uh, in the US today, and I, I think to a large degree reflected here in Canada as well, we have three basic mechanisms that we use at the local level to create growth. These are different than 100 years ago. 100 years ago, uh, back in the old style of development, if we were going to have growth and development at the local level, that was going to be a byproduct of things we did locally. If we wanted jobs, if we wanted growth, it was going to come from things that we did. After World War II, in the U.S., we, we made growth, job creation, development a shared responsibility between the state and federal governments and the local governments. And today, we use transfer payments between governments, the idea that the federal and the state will pay to help build sewer systems and water systems and expand roads and streets and, and make investments in civic infrastructure. We use Department of Transportation spending, transportation revenues from the federal government to build things like interchanges and bypasses, uh, traffic signals, frontage roads, and all these things that create a platform where at the local level we get growth. We use debt 
And while debt in the public sector is a very important part of this, uh, even more important is debt in the private sector. If you go back 100 years, there was no such thing as a 30-year mortgage. There was no such thing as secondary financing, securitization, and all these other things that we use today to create growth at the local level. We use these uh, financial mechanisms to create growth, and that growth, of course, increases our tax revenue. This is how we get the money to do the things at the local government level that we want to do. There's some really powerful incentives to look at these transactions in a positive way. When the federal government comes in and makes an investment in a water system, or the transportation uh, group comes in and makes an investment in a frontage road or an interchange, uh, or a private sector developer comes in and puts money into a, a new development on the edge of the city, as local taxpayers, our part of that transaction is very nominal. We might have a little bit of staff time we have to spend. We might have a little matching dollars that we have to throw at something. But generally, those costs are paid for by entities outside of the city. It's money that is coming into us. On the other hand, the tax revenue that accrues from this is ours. All of a sudden, we have all this new tax base. We have all this new revenue coming in. And so the net for us, initially, is always very positive. The catch. And the long-term catch is this, that we agree as part of the transaction to take over the maintenance of, of, of all of those systems. We agree to maintain the roads and the streets and the sidewalks, the sewer, the water, the pipes, the valves, everything that goes along with it. If you think this out over a long period of time, and remember, this is a very young experiment. We just started doing this literally 60, 70 years ago on the scale that we're doing it now. If you think this out over a very long period of time, there's only one or two ways that this strategy makes sense. Either growth is going to continue at ever accelerating rates. In other words, we're always going to be able to generate a whole bunch of new growth that will have very low cost but very high return for us on day one. And we can use that money to make good on all the obligations we've taken on over the years. Or the pattern of development, the way we're actually building, is going to generate more in revenue over the long term than it generates in costs. Now, for a while in the U.S., and, and, and to a lesser degree here, you got caught up in the delusion a little bit too, but not as much as the crazy Yankees did, right? Um, we believe that number one was true, that we could grow forever at accelerating rates and, and always kind of keep ahead of this Ponzi scheme we have going on. Uh, I think we've come to grips with at least most of the country that this isn't true. Unfortunately, number two is also not true, and this is where for a brief period of time, this presentation will get a touch technical. Uh, I'll walk you through it slowly so it's not too painful. Um, I'm an engineer. I'm a planner. Uh, I got an undergraduate degree in civil engineering. I have a master's degree in urban and regional planning. Uh, through that process uh, and through working in both of those professions, I, I become allergic to theoretical models. Uh, if you've ever worked with a theoretical model, you know that if it's a very complicated model, if it tries to model something as complex as an urban environment with all the different variables and all the different things that go on, uh, if you tweak the initial conditions of that model just a tiny bit, once they reflect through all that complexity, you get just wildly different outcomes. If you make your model too simple, on the other hand, you try to simplify all the complexity of an urban area into one or two or three different variables, uh, you, you lack any depth and your model is just completely not relevant. So instead of theoretically modeling the built environment and trying to figure out what's going on from a financial standpoint, what we have done is we have looked back and said, what were the investments we made in developments that, that in the past? And how did those turn out? And what can we learn from those investments and, and those uh, financial analyses? So this is probably the most simple development you're ever going to find. Uh, this is a dead-end cul-de-sac uh, with residential homes along it. There's no through traffic. There's no chance that there'll ever be any through traffic. There's no commercial traffic. The only people that use this road are the people that live along it. It's literally a dead-end cul-de-sac. These are like two-acre, two-and-a-half-acre lots. Uh, the city, this was built in the mid-1990s. The city's policy was that every lot in the city should be paved. And so the city went out and paved this. The city paid half, the property owners paid half. We asked the question, 
based on the revenue that the city is getting from the property owners within this development, remember, no through traffic, the only people that utilize this road are the people that live there, how long is it going to take them to recoup what they just spent to build that road? And the answer is 37 years. Now, the road's not going to last anywhere near 37 years, but it's going to take that long for the city just to recoup the half that they spent building it. It's entirely the city's responsibility to maintain it the second time around. This is a slightly more intense development. These are half acre, three quarter acre lots. The, uh, the, building, the, the lots on the west here are bigger, but you can see they have limited frontage. Again, you've got a closed loop system with a dead end cul-de-sac up there. There's no through traffic, no commercial traffic. The only people that use this development are the people that live within it. Uh, this was built in the early 1980s. The road had completely fallen apart. The city went out and fixed it. The cost was $354,000. We asked the question, based on the taxes that the city's collecting from the people that live within this development, again, the only people who are really using it, how long will it take them to recoup what they just spent to fix it? The answer is 79 years. The road won't last anywhere near that long. So we asked the question, let's say the city wanted to recoup enough money from these property owners to actually pay for that improvement before the next time the road fell apart. What would that mean? It would mean an immediate 46% increase in taxes with annual increases of 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years, with every penny of revenue going just to maintain the road. Now, sometimes people will say, well, Chuck, okay, we get it. We know we lose money on residential property. We make it up on commercial. Commercials are cash cow. Uh, to which, I, you know, my initial response is always, I don't know any corporation that loses money on 90% of its holdings and tries to make it up on the last 10. I don't know why an incorporated municipality would try to operate that way. But nonetheless, there's this notion that if we just have enough commercial, if we just have enough industrial, if we just have enough of this big uh, tax base kind of stuff, we can make that up. This is a business park. Uh, this we built in the mid-1990s. It was so successful that the city thought, uh, you know, it's every lot is built out. They want to repeat it on property they own just adjacent to it. They literally want to build the same exact thing on property right next door. So we asked the question, well, we can see what was built. Uh, if we could build the exact same cost development and get the exact same return, would that be a good investment for us? The cost in today's dollars is $2.1 million. The total amount of investment out there is $6.6 .6 million. Now pause for a second. Of that uh, private investment, four of those lots are a church. Uh, I, I don't know the tax laws here in Canada, but in the US, churches don't pay any taxes to the city. So the city's not getting any revenue from those four lots. Uh, two of the lots are a school bus maintenance facility. Uh, again, the school bus, school district is a public entity. They're not paying any taxes to the city. Uh, one of the lots is a county maintenance facility. One of the lots is a city maintenance facility. Of the remaining lots, the ones that are theoretically taxpayers, every single one was either sold for a dollar and or they were given a long-term tax subsidy to attract the business to open in the park in the first place. For the sake of our analysis, we assume that every single lot in this new development would be built on within 12 months. None of them would get a subsidy, all of them would be full taxpayers, and every penny of new revenue would go to retiring that debt. If that were the case, it would still take almost three decades, 29 years, for the city to break even. That's 29 years where everybody else's taxes would need to go up to cover the plowing the snow off the roads, the mowing the ditches, the police protection, fire protection, and every other service that would be needed out there. I used to go through and do about a dozen of these examples because I've got all different styles of developments in this new experimental, auto-oriented kind of approach. Uh, but what I found is that I can make my point with three, and everybody's eyes didn't gloss over. So if you want more of these examples, there's a bunch on our website, I'll give you that at the end. But I want to get to the kind of the punchline here so we can get to the next part, which is what do we do? Uh, and I want to show you uh, this. I I'm an engineer, so I like graphs. Again, I'll walk you through this one so it won't be painful. Let's pretend that the developer comes to town. This is, where, this is where I lost the developer in the front row last night. <laughs> he was not, not happy with me, was he? Um, let's say that a developer comes to town, and it could be you know, any style of development uh, that would be in this auto-oriented pattern. 
uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a private developer. Let, let's say, for example, a private developer comes to town, says, I would like to build on this piece of land out here. Uh, I'm willing to meet all of your requirements. Uh, I'm not asking for any, you know, money. I'm not asking for any subsidies. I'm not asking for any variances from what would normally be done. I'm willing to meet everything. I will build all the homes. I'll build all the commercial properties uh, with my money. Uh, I will build the sewer systems, the water systems, the roads, the streets, the sidewalks. I'll build everything the way that you want it to. The only thing that I'm asking is when I'm done building all this, that you agree as a city to take over the maintenance of all this infrastructure. I'm allowed to donate it to you to maintain. What would we say? We would say this is a fantastic transaction. You mean we pay nothing yet we get all of this new development? That's, that's wonderful. Uh, in fact, I was actually in a meeting once where a council member said, you mean we get all this for free? I'm like, yeah, you, you do, you know? Um, but let's say in the back of our minds, we, we've heard of this strong town stuff and we want to be you know, good, prudent Canadians, so we're going to put the money that would normally go to maintenance from this new development, we're going to, when that comes in every year, we're going to just set it aside. And every year we're going to allow it to grow, and then someday in the future when we have to make good on that promise we take on, that promise to maintain everything, we'll just go get that money and use it to fix it. This is what that would look like. In year one, uh, you would have this brand new development, you'd have new tax revenue coming in, You've spent nothing, it's brand new, so you don't have to go out and spend anything to fix it. So you take that money, and you take the money that would go to maintenance, and you set it aside. In year two, you've got more money coming in, and you set that aside, you add it to what you had in year one. In year three, you add in year four, and on and on and on. Every year, you're adding that money. Everything is relatively brand new. Even when you get 20 years out, your street, you don't have to spend any money on it. The pipe, you don't have to spend any money on it. It's all fine. But in this example, when you get to year 25, and you have to actually go out and fix something, what you find is that the cumulative amount of money that you brought in, in this style of development, is not sufficient enough to cover the cost. And from a cash flow standpoint, you go far into the negative. Now, cities aren't one development. Cities are a collection of developments. So for the sake of this conversation, let's say that our developer comes back two years later and says, you know, this development worked out so well for me, it worked out so well for you, I, I would like to do a similar size development. And in fact, every other year into the future, a developer comes in and does a similar size development. In other words, this is a scenario that every city wants. Nice, steady, continuous growth. You're never being overwhelmed, but you're never without growth. Everything is growing at a nice, steady level. And you take that money that would normally go towards maintenance and you set that aside and you save it for the day when you have to make good on the promise when you took over that donation to maintain all of those systems. This is what that looks like. In year one, you have one development, you have a little bit of money. In year three now, you've got two developments that are paying into the system. In year five, you've got three, in year seven, four, and on and on and on. Everything is relatively brand new, so it doesn't cost you anything. It's just money coming in, but nothing going out. And when you get you know, up here a couple decades, you see that not only are you bringing in money from each development, but when you add all these new developments, your revenues kind of start to accelerate upwards. They get this upward slant to the curve. You're making a lot of money. And when you get to year 25, the year you have to make good on that very first promise you made when you took over that first development, it's okay. You've got the money, right? You've had all of this growth. And while you've got to spend a little bit, you know, you've got plenty. This is what we call the illusion of wealth. Because we all intuitively understand that if you lose money on every transaction, you don't make it up in volume. When you lose money over the long term on every project that you take on, the further you go out into the time horizon, the more downward pressure there is on your budget. Now, I began this whole conversation by saying this is a very young experiment, right? We've only been doing this 60, you know, 60 plus years. And I've had people stand up and say, well, Chuck, you know, we should have gone broke a long time ago. Uh, how are we able to get this far if this pattern of building is so unproductive? Uh, this is a graph of debt. Now, you guys are familiar because you watch our news for some reason, I, I don't fathom. I don't even watch our news, okay? I don't know why you would. Uh, but I, you know, I'm at my hotel and I turn on 
uh, you know, and you've got all of our news channels. I'm like, why would you do that to yourselves? Um, you guys understand that we have this little debt problem, right? We just had this little debate, this kind of crazy thing where we talked about what to do about our debt, and then we decided, you know what, we'll talk about that in four months. Um, our national debt is this enormous sum of money. Uh, it, it, you know, I've had seven quarters of calculus. I'm not going to pretend to be able to explain what a trillion dollars is, let alone 17 trillion. It's unfathomable. In fact, as a kid uh, growing up, when I was in fourth grade, we had this uh, little handout in school that tried to describe the, the national debt. It said, if you converted the national debt into dollar bills and stacked them on top of each other, it would go to the moon and back like 23 times or something. As if taking one abstract concept and comparing it to another <laughs> abstract concept <laughs> would make things clear for a nine-year-old, right? So we're talking about sums of money beyond our capacity to grasp, right? When we're talking about the US federal debt. In this graph, the bottom line, the blue one here, that's the growth in the US federal debt. The black one right above it, that's GDP. The green one, that one that soars up like that, that's our private sector debt. That's debt that Americans have as individuals. That's home mortgages, commercial real estate loans, auto loans, credit cards, margin interest accounts, student loans. The way we financed growth in this new experimental style during the first life cycle was by using our savings and then reinvesting that illusion of wealth back into more growth. When that stopped working, in other words, when we had to start paying out and things started to get more difficult and we actually had a drag of having to maintain stuff, we eventually switched from an economy based on growth through savings and investment to an economy based on growth through debt accumulation. And as we crossed over into the third life cycle, debt accumulation became such an important part of our economy that we actually allowed it to become predatory. We actually changed our rules so you didn't have to have a job to buy a house, you didn't have to have income to buy a house, you didn't even have to you know, be able to make a, your first payment to buy a house. We encouraged people who couldn't afford homes to buy homes, people who could afford small homes to buy large homes, people who could afford large homes to speculate on multiple large homes. Our capacity to continue this experiment by having the private sector take on ever-increasing levels of debt is just simply not there. And we've reached a point where uh, our ability to kind of keep this going uh, is coming to an end. Obviously, there's some huge implications here. The mechanisms of growth, the way we've become accustomed to managing and paying for growth at the local level are waning. Uh, our federal government does not have the money to spend on local growth initiatives. Uh, our transportation departments have vastly more miles of highway to maintain than they have money coming in. Literally, the money that kept coming in is anywhere from 10 cents to 30 cents on the dollar of what they need to maintain everything. Uh, this is a nation, you know, nationwide. The private sector is tapped out and does not have the capacity to have accelerating levels of debt in order to create new growth at the local level. This means that our local governments are going to be forced to absorb the cost of our development pattern. All those miles of road we built in this experiment, if we want those fixed, we're going to have to fix them. All those miles of pipe that we built post-World War II, spreading out all over the place, if we want that fixed, we're going to have to find the money to do that. This can't be done in the current pattern of development without some enormously large tax increases or some devastatingly large cuts in services. Now this is the debate we're having at every level of government in the states. And I know to a degree you are here too. This is kind of the ongoing debate of government, right? How uh, big are the tax increases gonna be and who's gonna pay them? How deep is the service cut gonna be and where is that gonna be felt? It's critical at the local level that we see the third variable of that sentence. The third variable being the current pattern of development. As long as we continue to build in a format and a style that provides us with an illusion of wealth today, but a long-term liability that's greater than we have the capacity to pay for, there's no way that our local governments can avoid real financial hardship. 
as long as we continue to build in a style that costs us more over the long run than it generates in wealth for our communities, there's no way that our communities can afford, can, can avoid defaulting on their obligations. We literally have to have a conversation about the financial uh, return on our pattern of development and how to build our places to be financially solvent. So what's the solution? And I had, to, I had to put this slide on the presentation because as I'm going around the country talking to different groups, we would go through this and, and, and go through all of the kind of different ways we need to look differently and think differently about this and, and things we should do to start correcting these complex set of problems we've created for ourselves. And someone inevitably would stand up in the back at the end and say, Chuck, uh, we came here tonight, you scared the heck out of us, but you didn't give us the solution. What is the solution? And I kept getting this question over and over and over, and it was frustrating to me because I thought, aren't I, aren't, isn't this what I'm talking about? Aren't I talking about the solution? You know, this set of strategies that we need to do? What I realized after a while was that I was hearing the question wrong. What I was hearing was, how do we solve, what, what, what's the magic bullet solution for this? What can someone else change about what they're doing so that I don't have to change anything about what I'm doing, okay? I know of no such solution. Uh, we've literally created with this experimental pattern of building uh, a very unique set of problems that we face. And we're not going to be able to solve them in the sense that there's something easy that we can do. We're literally going to have to roll up our sleeves and start talking about how do we make some different day-to-day -day decisions about how we approach uh, building and developing. I like to start with this. Again, this is my hometown back in 1904. And as a planner, I look at this, and I can't help but just loving this place. If you look at the, you know, the layout of the, of the buildings, the way they line up, the way they frame the public realm, the way the public realm is segmented into the great space, the buildings themselves have great symmetry, great interaction with the street. This is a phenomenal place. It was financially very strong. And do you know how we know that? There was nothing propping it up. If this place hadn't been financially very sound, it would have gone away like thousands of other small towns did around the country. But this place didn't. Let me ask you a couple questions about this place and these people. How thick was their zoning code? <laughs> Not at all. How many boards and committees did they have to go to to get an approval to build something? <coughs> How many inspectors and uh, you know, site visits did they have to do? <coughs> How much tax subsidy did they get when they were building this? How much federal and state uh, money did they get pumped into their community to make this happen? If you go through the litany of things that we do today as a matter of just daily business, in order to create growth and development and jobs at the local level, they had none of that. Yet, they built places that were very, very spectacular. How do they know how to do this? It's really simple. They just copied what they knew worked. These were a bunch of illiterate lumberjacks in the middle of the north woods of Minnesota. The same type of people that founded this city, right? In the middle of nowhere. And they got off the train, they cut down some trees, they started building with the materials they had in a style that was universal. A style and a pattern that they knew worked. After 60 years of engineers like me, planners like me, economic development professionals and others giving advice to cities on how we can improve on this pattern, this is what the street looks like today. <laughs> Yeah, it's a wasteland of parking and half-occupied buildings. And if you want to understand in one snapshot why American cities are going broke, there's a half million dollars of infrastructure in those two blocks. And what is our return on that investment? What do we get back for, our, for, that, for building that in the first place and then maintaining it over the decades? We don't get hardly anything back. I was in uh, Boise, Idaho, giving a talk uh, to some university students, and someone uh, stood up at this point and said, uh, I'm from Costa Rica, 
And I've never understood why you build this way here. We, we don't build this way in Costa Rica. We're a very poor country. When we build, we build one block at a time. And before we build the next block, we have to fill in every gap in the prior block because we, we just don't have the money to, to spread out like that and have places that have big gaps like that. We're, we're a very poor country. <laughs> we don't have the money to do it either. You know, we, we've had this illusion of wealth that's allowed us to overlook this and think that we can get by by having gaps like this. And literally, we can go around Vancouver and find lots of places like this, right? Uh, you know, we can go around every city in this country, uh, every city on this continent, and find lots of places like this. Uh, no one prior generations in the old style of development would have built like this because it financially made no sense. <laughs> So let's talk about where we go from here. And I know you guys are having some debates right now, certainly last night in Surrey we got a little bit of this uh, about whether we're gonna build highways out on the edge and interchanges and all this stuff, or whether we're gonna focus on other parts of our community. I, I, I wanna help you kind of crystallize the financial ramifications of that a little bit. Because when we build out on the edge and we build the interchanges and we plan on all the greenfield development, a lot of what we're doing today is this. It's this idea of build it and they will come. This is a, uh, something that has crept into our culture in what we call the desperation phase of this suburban experiment, where we become so desperate for growth that we will throw money at creating new development. Build it and they will come is an amazing uh, movie plot, right? You've got baseball, you've got cornfields. It's not hockey, but, you know, I'm a baseball fan. To me, this has got everything. Building They Will Come is a great movie. It, it is a horrible economic development strategy. <laughs> and really, it's not how wealth has ever been created in all of human history. Uh, do you guys recognize this street here? This street is my hometown, the same exact street as this, but 30 years earlier. This is 1870. And you can imagine these, you know, illiterate lumberjacks getting off the train uh, here. The train was actually right behind these buildings. The Mississippi River was right over that tree line. You can imagine them getting off the train, uh, cutting down the trees, planting the wood, and then popping up these little buildings uh, there to form the first Main Street. This is how every city in the world was started. This is how Vancouver was started, right? And if you, if you look at this, you know, you've you got to ask, you know, you, you, when you look at this picture and you see this, like, modest little investment along here, understand that we did this thousands and thousands of times around the world. And for a complex set of reasons, reasons that defy our ability to model, defy our ability to project, defy our ability to, to really even understand, you know, was the the wrong people at the wrong time in the wrong place or whatever, a lot of these places failed. They failed. What happened when they failed? Did the stock market drop 20%? Did the banks need huge bailouts? Did your pension fund lose a bunch of money? You know, did unemployment skyrocket? No. These were little tiny investments. And so when they failed, what happened? The people would just pluck the windows out of the building they would pull the iron down off the walls, and they would move on to the next city. And that next city, for a, a variety of reasons that are too complex to model, too complex to understand, it was the right people at the right time in the right place, a lot of those cities prospered, including mine. And after 30 years of small, incremental investments, that street became that street. And if you think about a pattern of development, the traditional style of development that we've used on the grid for thousands and thousands of years, you look at it as this tiny little increments of growth over a broad period of time, over a wide spectrum. And you see a city like this go from little shacks to two and three story wood structures to rock and granite facades. This is 40 years later, okay? So when you saw that picture of the parking lots and all that, we didn't tear down the wood structures, we tore down this. No city ever got rich 
by going to the casino and putting it all on red. The way you build wealth in a community is by making small, modest investments over a broad spectrum over a long period of time. That is the way you build wealth. And let me show you how that traditional development pattern is really a wealth generating machine. These are two identical blocks. The one on the left we call old and blighted, the one on the right we call shiny and new. They're the exact same size, they have the exact same amount of public infrastructure, they abut the same neighborhood, the same highway, everything about them is the same except the style of development. The old and blighted block uh, looks like this, it's old and blighted. Uh, the city's plans actually call for it to be torn down. Uh, if you think back to that original picture of the original Main Street in my hometown, the little pop-up buildings, this is, the, this is the 1920s version of that. So as the core of the city was growing up and growing in intensity, the city was continuing to grow out in small increments. And the first increment was this, you know, it was the little modest little investment, right? But then what happened? The Great Depression happened, World War II happened, and then we adopted a completely different development style, and these properties just stagnated. They've literally stagnated for 90 years. And so they look like they did in their initial condition. They never got to two stories and three stories. They never matured because the development just moved on out to the edge. So, you know, you've got the pawn shop, you've got the liquor store, you've got the bail bonds. This is a pretty low uh, value part of town. Two blocks over it used to look exactly like this, but that got torn down, and now we have the drive through taco joint. Now, everybody was thrilled about the drive through taco joint, right? Because not only did we get rid of blight, but the taco joint met all of our zoning codes. It met all of our requirements. They got plenty of parking. Uh, the sign met the sign regulations. The floor area ratios were all right. Uh, even the environmentalists were happy because they got them to put native plants in the stormwater areas. Uh, the, the bike advocates were happy because they got them to build a sidewalk. The sidewalk actually ends right there. But you've got, you know, that little bit right there. It's a start, I guess. Here's what nobody bothered to look at and nobody bothered to calculate. That old and blighted block that nasty, run-down block that everybody thinks is so terrible has a total value of $1.1 million. The same size, the same area, but in the new experimental style of building has a value of only $800,000. That junky, run-down block is worth 41% more. Now, understand what you're looking at. You're looking at the traditional style of development, the style that we used around the world for thousands and thousands of years in its very infancy, in its like initial state. This is like the little pop-up, little tiny investment that then the expectation in that style is that it would continue to grow and mature and become more intense and more valuable. Yet in that condition, it still outperforms the brand new auto-oriented style of development by 41%. Massively productive style of building. Let me ask you a couple questions. Let's say that we walk out of here and, and we realize that the biggest problem that our cities have is not a lack of growth, but a lack of financial productivity, a lack of productive growth. And so we say as an objective that we're gonna try to increase the productivity of all of our spaces. And on these blocks, our goal over the next decade is to have them double in value. We don't have any money to spend, or very modest sums of money, so we can't do huge things. But we want to try to, over the next decade, have these places double in value. Tell me what you would do for that old and blighted property to have it double in value over the next decade. Paint. Maybe paint the front. Yeah, I see. Perfect. Maybe... Put in a little parklet, yeah, that's a great idea. Maybe put in some bike racks, maybe sweep the sidewalks, I don't know. Um, maybe slow down the cars out front. Uh, you know, you, you, you don't need an engineer or a planner to tell you what to do there to make that more valuable, right? We could take 50 random people off the street, sit them down in a focus group and say, come up with 100 ideas to make this street more valuable. You have no money to work with or very little. What would you do? And they would come up with 100 ideas, right? No problem. 
Tell me what you would do to double the value of that taco joint over the next decade. There really is no strategy. There's nothing you can do. Understand, understand the implications. This old and blighted pattern, the traditional style of development, has enormous financial upside and very limited downside. While the new experimental auto style of development has very limited upside, but a downside that can literally go negative. We all know the trajectory of the suburban taco joint, right? 20 years from now, there'll be a new taco joint two miles up the road. That one will be a used car lot. And then 10 years after that, it will be boarded up and they'll be selling drugs out the back door and there'll be some kind of tax subsidy that will be needed to tear it down and make it into something new, right? You have a very resilient pattern of building in the traditional style, a very fragile pattern of building in the new experimental style. Let me show you uh, another example. Uh, this is on the edge of the city. This is uh, 19 acres of the Mills Fleet Farm property. You guys have like Canada Tire, right? Canadian, Canadian Tire, thank you. Um, Mills Fleet Farm is, I think, similar to Canadian Tire, at least that's my impression. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Mills Fleet Farm, uh, you go to Mills Fleet Farm, you have uh, auto parts, cow food, uh, lumber, guns, uh, <laughs> yeah, camouflage lingerie. <laughs> that's your product mix. Is that? Does yeah. that describe Canadian? Huh? No? <laughs> Close? No guns, yeah, that's true. No guns. Hockey sticks. Yeah, hockey sticks. Yeah, yeah. More I think you could get a couple of those at Fleet Farm. This is the most valuable investment in my hometown. This is 19 acres. You've got the big box store. Uh, they doubled it in size. You've got an uh, auto dealership and a gas station. 19 acres. When the Mills people show up at a council meeting, they stop the council meeting and they ask the Mills people, what can we do to help you, right? This is 19 acres of uh, my downtown. Uh, so same size area, different style of development, right? Uh, any of you seen the movie Fargo? Yeah, the movie Fargo was meant to depict essentially my hometown. Uh, not a very nice depiction, but probably closer to accurate than we would like to think. Um, my, the downtown in my hometown is rather run down. The second and third stories are largely unoccupied, boarded up. Uh, the first stories are, are not doing that well either. Uh, in my life, the only real investment in the downtown has been by fire. So when I was in junior high, uh, those two burnt down. They're now a parking lot. Uh, in high school, that one burnt down. It's now a parking lot. When I was in college, those burnt down, and they're now a parking lot. So essentially, when something burns down, we go clean it up and then turn it into a parking lot. Right? The Fleet Farm property, the 19 acres on the edge of town, has a total value of $0.6 million per acre. Downtown, uh, the same size area, 19 acres, just a different style of development, has a value of $1.1 million, a full 78% more. Now let me ask you a couple of questions about this. Uh, how much did we have to spend to get that Mills Fleet Farm property? The, the, department, the transportation department spent $100 million on the bypass of the city. Uh, you know, millions on that traffic signal. We spent $36 million running sewer out to the site. Uh, I don't know how much the water was, but I, I think it's probably an equivalent amount of money. Uh, the, uh, the, the highway department spent half a million last year on just that intersection. When I was an engineer, I actually designed that road right there. That was 2.2 million. Uh, we have spent millions and millions of dollars to get this investment, a very low yielding investment, and some other things up and down this highway corridor that are even less uh, financially productive. How much did my generation spend on that downtown property? that 19 acres in the downtown. That is wealth that was created by my great-great-grandparents and their contemporaries that they built slowly and methodically over time and essentially gifted to our generation. 
This is the wealth creation machine that they built that is still paying enormous dividends to us today, even though we completely neglect it and have let it go bad. It still outperforms the best of what we've been able to do. One last question on this slide. Uh, what happens when Mills Fleet Farm goes out of business? And if you take a long-term view of history, uh, you know, half of all businesses fail. Uh, you know, you can go back and look at what was on the Dow Jones uh, 30 years ago, and a, a large percentage of those businesses have gone through bankruptcy. It's not unforeseen that Mills Fleet Farm will not make it the next three decades. You know, what, what happens when it goes out of business? What happens? What happens to that car dealership, that gas station, that huge big box store? I have no clue. I have no clue. What happens when one of the 134 businesses in the downtown goes out of business? It becomes an opportunity for someone else, right? In the down, in the traditional style of development, you have an ecosystem of, of finance going on. It's very resilient. In the new style, the auto-oriented experimental style, we put all our eggs in one big basket. And it gives us this huge return initially, but it makes us very, very <coughs> fragile over the long term. I have a really good friend named Joe Minicozzi, and one of the brilliant things that he has done is analyze the financial productivity of different parcels. And he actually has a way of plotting it up on a map. Uh, if you think of it, he's taken every parcel and he, he projects up their financial productivity. In other words, how much money the city is getting off of that particular property in relation to all the other ones. And him and I were recently in High Point, North Carolina, and did this presentation for them. And I guess you'll never guess where their traditional development pattern downtown is. <laughs> this is a typical city where you have the nice grid in the downtown. Uh, you have very modest type of building. You have some tall buildings, but really a lot of two and three story construction. And then out on the edge, you've got all the interchanges. You've got all the single family homes on the cul-de-sacs. You've got all the auto-oriented stuff. And you can see by comparison how vastly more financially productive that old style of building is to what our post-World War II experiment is. Let me give you uh, one little detail on this. This is where I, I got to look at you, my friend. Um, this is called a, strode. this is a strode. Um, actually, we're in, the, we're in the Urban Dictionary now, right? You and me. Um, this is a strode, this is a street road hybrid. We call this the futon of transportation. Uh, if you think of a futon as an uncomfortable couch that makes into an uncomfortable bed, this is a piece of transportation infrastructure that tries to function both as a road and a street. Uh, what is a road? A road is a high-speed connection between two places. If you think of a road today in automobile terms as a replacement for the railroad, the railroad being a road on rails, a railroad had a stop you got on here and a stop you got off here and a high-speed connection between the two. There weren't stops, little stops along the way. There weren't frontage roads and strip malls and drive-throughs for the, you know, the railroad didn't do that. It just went from one place to the other very quickly. We tried to design uh, strodes to function like roads and get you from one place to the other very quickly. And so we do things like make the lanes uh, as wide as a highway style lane uh, we add uh, turn lanes so we can get the turning traffic out of the way so the through traffic can fly through without having to slow down. So we spend a lot of money to create an environment to move cars very quickly, as in a road. But do the cars get to move quickly? No, because the speed limits are low and you've got traffic signals and all this complexity and so people have to drive slow through this environment. What is a street? A street is a platform for creating and capturing value. And if you look, we've designed elements of a street into the strode. We've got wide sidewalks, we've got decorative lighting, we've got buildings that come up and try to frame the public realm. But is the street creating any value? If you look, you know, if, if you were going to uh, go out to, you know, if you were going to go to this store here, and then you wanted to go and go to this store over here, no one's going to walk across seven lanes, right? No one's going to walk down to this light and then cross over and walk back. They're going to get in their car, 
They're going to whip a U-turn and they're going to go to that property, right? And all the businesses know and understand that. So if you look at them, what have they done? They all cater to the auto-oriented style of consumer. They have parking lots, they have drive throughs and you get a return on your investment that is closer to that taco joint than that old and blighted block. Not very productive. Strodes are the default building style for transportation systems today. And, you know, we build a, a, an incredible number of strodes. They're very, very expensive to build, first of all. Uh, and they're very, very unproductive because they neither move people quickly nor do they create a lot of tax base value. So, as a strategy, what we need to do is we need to pick a side. We literally need to get off of this continuum and say, are we going to build a piece of transportation infrastructure here to move people? If so, we got to call it a road and we got to design it as a road. Roads do not have complexity. They're very simple environments. They have wide lanes. They do not have accesses. They get you from one place to the other very, very quickly, efficiently, and safely. And actually, building roads are not that expensive. If we want to create value, if we want to actually have businesses and homes and hotels and, and, and all the different you know, complexities that go with an urban environment, if we're trying to build a place that's going to create value, then we have to start talking about streets. And streets require a totally different set of values than a road. Streets are very complex places. Streets not only accommodate people, they actually elevate people above cars. You actually are designing environments for people walking, people biking, people in wheelchairs, people on roller skates, what have you. Complex urban environments, the more complex, the better. And when we talk about congestion, you know, we always get obsessed about congestion. In urban areas, congestion is actually a benefit. It's actually uh, a, a helpful thing. Because a congestion is a signal to people that, you know, there's, this is a place for investment. I want you to think about the values that we apply to these places. And I'm going to give you a little insight from the engineering profession that may startle you a little bit when we talk about designing spaces. Because as engineers, we have a certain value set that we apply to any design of a transportation system. Uh, the first thing we do is we say, what is the speed that we're designing for? What is the design speed? And once we have the design speed, we say, what's the volume of cars that we're supposed to design for? Once we have a design speed and a volume, then we say, how do we make this as safe as possible? And then how much is that going to cost? This is the road mentality. These are the values that the engineering profession applies when we go out to build a piece of transportation infrastructure. Let me ask you a question. Of those four, speed, volume, safety, cost, which one would you put first? <laughs> okay, I realize we're in, in Canada here. Which one would you guys put first? Safety? Okay. Which one would you put next? All right. What would you put next now? Would you want to move uh, a lot of cars, or would you want the cars to be able to go fast? A lot of cars. Okay. Our values are different than the way we're building our places. And when we get to urban areas, when we get to the areas where we live, where we're creating streets that are complex environments where we're trying to create and capture value, we literally need to insist on a different set of values. Okay? We need to insist on it because that's what our values are. Last big concept here. There's, a, there's an idea out of Silicon Valley that's a really powerful one. And it will kind of help us get to the next step about how we start to transform our places. And it goes like this. Innovation that happens from the top down tends to be orderly but dumb. While innovation that happens from the bottom up tends to be chaotic but smart. Uh, this came out of Silicon Valley but really uh, you know, it has to do with any kind of natural system that you'll ever find. Natural systems tend to be very chaotic, very messy. Uh, but over time, the evolutionary process comes to bear, and you get 
outcomes that are very refined and almost miraculous in terms of, of their adaptability and their, their just uh, ability to mesh in with the complexities around them. I want to show you what this looks like from a city standpoint. Do any of you guys recognize this city? Memphis. Who said that? Dude, yeah. <laughs> they, they would be embarrassed that not all of you do that. You know, this is like their icon, right? Right? This is Memphis, Tennessee. Okay? Um, Memphis, Tennessee is, is a wonderful place. It, it really has some fantastic people in it. I've done a, a little bit of work in Memphis and gotten to know them. Uh, their mayor, their council, they have a design innovation team that's doing some very, very great work. But this is Memphis, Tennessee. And Memphis, Tennessee, if you look at statistics in the U.S., Memphis and Detroit uh, are kind of one, two, in pretty much every negative statistic. Uh, out of wedlock, births, crime, poverty, you know, you, you go down the list and they're right there. Uh, so Memphis is a place that is struggling. If you look at the history of Memphis post-World War II, you see a city that has embraced every single suggestion and every single fad of the planning, engineering, and economic development professions. You see the highways run through the middle of the community, the wide roads being built, the highways run out to the edge, the sewer and water extended out, the beltway built, the, uh, the blighted areas torn down and replaced with the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Section 8 housing, the, the projects. Uh, you see the second beltway actually being built when the sewer and water was run past the first one. Uh, you have businesses that were paid to move to town, businesses that were paid to stay in town. And kind of the pinnacle of the insanity of this approach is this pyramid right here. <laughs> This is, uh, and you can imagine these guys sitting around in the, you know, unsmoke-filled room these days, but the room with, you know, the mayor, uh, the heavy hitters on the council, the heavy hitters in the business community and what have you, sit around going, well, what are we going to do to get things going here? What we really need to do is we need to attract a basketball team. If we could just have a basketball team, this would be a great city and that greatness would trickle down to all the neighborhoods and all the people, and we just have a lot of prosperity here. And so they went out and they built a basketball stadium in an attempt to get a team to move there. They were successful, and they did get a team to move there. The only problem is the team didn't like this stadium. And so they wound up building them another stadium six blocks away from this one. This one today sits empty. And they're actually in the process of subsidizing the Bass Pro Company to the tune of $25 million to get them to open up a fish and tackle shop in a pyramid in downtown Memphis. Okay? Orderly but dumb. Let me show you what chaotic but smart looks like. This is another block. This is another, uh, this is a block in Memphis, Tennessee. This is actually called Broad Avenue. And after post, you know, this project, they actually named this project a new face for an old broad. Um, a group of people living in the area of this broad avenue, a couple dilapidated blocks, rundown area, uh, actually sick of the neglect, sick of the city not doing anything to help them, sick of it being run down, went to the hardware store, bought their own buckets of paint, painted crosswalks, painted sidewalks, and painted parking lanes. And at the end of the project had a kind of a nice little place. You know, they swept the sidewalks, they invited some vendors to come in and sell food out of the stores without a permit, you know, for a couple days. They invited some people to open an art gallery in the vacant stores for a couple days. Again, they bypassed the permitting process. They said, forget, forget all that. We're not going to do that. You know, we're going to be gone before the police show up to arrest us, so we're just going to do it, right? I was out here a year after this project. Every single storefront was filled. Before the project, only a couple of them were full. Every single one was full. The second stories were all occupied. And I talked to the landlord, and the landlord said he was able to charge double the amount of rent on the last place to rent than he was the first place. Uh, the city has since come back and studied this, and they found that uh, they created $12 million of new investment in these two blocks as a result of this project. They have created uh, somewhere around 30 new jobs on this block. Uh, about, I, I can't think of the exact, it's like a dozen new businesses. 
you look at chaotic but smart, you're looking at some people with a little bit of elbow grease, a few hundred bucks of paint, and, and all of a sudden, the return on that investment is enormous, right? Now, I don't know what you would do in Vancouver, but I can tell you what my city would do. If we were out there with buckets of paint, you know, doing this, if they didn't arrest us on the spot, on Monday morning, the city engineer, the city attorney would be out, and they'd say, you know, I've got the technical manual here. This doesn't meet our standard. That line is not exactly straight. Someone's going to wander outside of this crosswalk and get struck, and then we're going to be liable. So we're going to go get rid of all this. And they'd be out there, you know, half an hour later with the pressure washers getting rid of all this. The city of Memphis is desperate, and the city of Memphis is smart. And so what have they done? They actually did go out with pressure washers, and they did get rid of this, only so that they could put it down permanently. They went out, they put down permanent striping, because they said, we, this worked. This was a low cost investment. It cost us nothing, but it worked, and look what happened. We don't want this block to go backward. <clears throat> then they did an amazing thing. They said, you know what, while we're out here, it's really not going to cost us that much to extend this a block in either direction. Let's extend this out, the striping a little bit, and see if some of the good things happening here will spill over into these other parts of the neighborhood. Then they sat down and looked around and said, you know what, do we have any other parts of our city that are like this? Where maybe we could go out and paint a little bit and have a little block party and invite some people and get similar style of results? This is chaotic but smart. It's messy. Some of these things don't work. Uh, but when they do, the return that you get is amazing. We have to be able to embrace the chaotic but smart approach if we want those fine grain investments, the high return ones uh, that are going to improve our cities and make them financially viable. I want to tell you a little thing about this guy here. This is George. Um, George, uh, do you know George? You don't, you've never chatted with him at all. George is uh, one of these guys that I met virtually through our website. Uh, when In the early days of Strong Towns, I would, I would put something up on our blog, and like 10 minutes later, this guy would have a comment or a post. And he'd be, Chuck, I don't understand this. I don't understand that. Explain this. This doesn't make any sense. And, you know, I would try to respond, and I'd try to answer, but he, uh, he was just, it was like he lived on my blog just waiting for me to post. I, I couldn't understand it. And his questions were, you know, they were okay, but I don't want to say they were beneath me, but it was like, seriously, do I have to explain this to you again and again and again? And it, it, was, it, it was a little bit of tension there. After a while, uh, he started emailing me, and then we became Facebook friends. And you know how like that little pop-up thing happens? So I'm at work and it's pop-up, pop-up, pop-up all the time. Uh, you know, he's always got all these questions for me. And we, we got to be friends and we got to know each other a little bit, on, just online. And at one point he said, you know, I, I'm starting to get you a little bit. And I'm comfortable enough now where I would like you to come to my community and give a curbside chat talk. Uh, he was about two hours away. Uh, and so I said, well, let's set a date and I'll come and I'll do that. So, so we did. He had about 20 people that showed up and we had a very nice conversation. And afterwards we went out to eat and I found out that George uh, was a former music major. That's what I actually wanted to do, but my dad said, you won't have a job if you do that. So I went into engineering instead. He does not have a job. Uh, <laughs> he, he actually runs a daycare out of his house. Um, so that, that is a job, I guess. But. Um, he, uh, he, he, yeah, yeah, no, I was, he runs a daycare of his house, but his wife does all the work, so. <laughs> so, George and I are sitting at dinner, right? And uh, I'm, I'm looking at this guy, and I'm saying, what am I doing with my life? You know, I, I, I have a degree in engineering, I have a degree in planning, I, I think I have a lot of knowledge. I'm trying to share it with the world, I'm trying to help make cities better, and I'm sitting at a restaurant with a guy who plays trombone and can't get a job, and, you know, how am I affecting anything? Is this what my life has become? You know, I was like, if, if I have to go around and meet a George all over the place, it, it just, this isn't making, I'm not getting anywhere. This is not working. <clears throat> 
So I went home and, you know, went on doing my stuff. And one day I got this email from George, would you send me your slides? So I sent him my slides. And then he sent me this email. He said, check this out. And it was a video of him at his city council meeting giving the curbside chat to them. Now, none of the council members would show up at our meeting. They, didn't, they thought George was crazy too, right? <laughs> so he went to them and he gave it to them. And the cool thing was, every other slide was mine and every other slide was his. So here's my slide, and then here's the local interpretation. Then here's my slide, then here's the local interpretation. It was the curbside chat for his community that I could never give. And now all of a sudden, here's George. He's got a neighborhood group that's meeting at the coffee shop. They're going out and putting in crosswalks. They're planting trees in the boulevard. His kids walked to school, and the route was dangerous, and so they set up a walking school bus to help walk the kids to school. They made the route a little bit nicer. They actually had a Walgreens come to town, and George's little group showed up at the meeting and got the whole design of the Walgreens reoriented. All of a sudden, George is like the difference maker in his community. We went back to the office and we sat down, what did we say? We said, we need more Georges. <laughs> we don't need more Chucks. We don't need more engineers doing something. We don't need to change the planning world. What we need are more Georges. We need more people in more places who have no qualifications at all, but know their place intimately and love it and live it and want to make it better. Out there, engaged and involved in doing it. And so we've tried to create a platform and we're in the very infancy of doing this saying how do we help these Georges emerge you my friend are a George and are a massive inspiration to me when when Neil put up this Strode to Boulevard uh, blog uh, I don't you know I know you thought you were hacking off of my stuff but you were really honoring everything we do it was very humbling uh, to see that so you know every community needs these people uh, taking the message, adapting it to them, and working on it. We have been doing this in my own hometown. Uh, we've started some neighborhood groups. We've actually gone out in uh, this one neighborhood and been doing for the last six months block parties, scavenger hunts, trying to meet people. We've painted crosswalks. We've put up flags. We've tried to study how people uh, use and interact with the neighborhood. And two weeks ago, we came out with this report called Neighborhoods First that actually lays out eight investments that the city can make that will improve this one tiny little neighborhood uh, and make it more livable and more valuable for the people who are there today. Uh, you know, when was the city and said, you know what, uh, I think you could really use a sidewalk here. And they're like, well, why would you say that, Chuck? Um, well, I, I don't know, you know. I'm, I'm watching people walk through there and it seems like that would be a pretty logical investment to make. Uh, you have a, a store over here, a neighborhood over here, and, you know, an observable need. Right now, my city is in the process of doing a $7.1 million project to run sewer and water two miles out of town. Uh, our project, $16,700. And when we analyze the return on investment from our project, it is multiples, multiples of what the city is looking at spending. If we can do this style of building, this style of growth, this style of intervention, have our Georges out there working in our communities, identifying those things that will make our day-to-day -day interactions with the places we live more fulfilling, more productive, more valuable for us, that will be reflected not only in a higher quality of life for everyone, but in a higher return on investment and better financial strength and solvency for our cities. For some reason, my power is about to go out, so thank goodness it's the last slide. Um, the current path that cities are on is not financially stable. Uh, this is a very young experiment. We have all kind of learned from each other, but not learned from history. And so we've all arrived at a very fragile place at the same time. This means that the future for most cities is not going to resemble the recent past. We're, there's this notion that you know, we're going through a transition now. When we're done with this transition, we'll get right back to, to where we were. Where we were was a bubble. We're not going back. And the beginning conditions of the next 60 years are vastly different than the post-World War II period. We are in a different world. And we're going to transform into some other way of doing business. 
We're not going to pretend to know what that is, and we don't know what it is. But what we do know is that the determinant of the places that are going to be successful and prosperous is already the ability of local leaders to transform their communities. And it's not the leaders as in the mayor and the city council and the business people. It's the leaders as in the Georges. The people in their communities who want to step up, who want to meet their neighbors, who want to form groups, who want to talk about their places, who want to make a difference day to day in the trenches and the very blocks and streets that we live. Those are the leaders that we need to step up and be part of the next wave of great city building. So with that, um, we have a blog that we publish uh, weekdays. That's at strongtowns.org. Our podcast is there too, and we have a, a video channel there as well. Uh, we have a social network that we created. If you want to see Neil talk, uh, write like 50 paragraphs on macroeconomics, or if you want to talk with other people around the world who are working on doing these things in their communities, there's a really good discussion going on there. That's at strongtowns.net. Uh, last year, we published a book. It's kind of a primer on Strong Towns, a Strong Towns 101. We've got a handful of those. Jim's got them up at the top of the steps. They're $10. Uh, we will gladly take Canadian currency because it's more stable than ours. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, uh, I want to thank you so very much. I, I really am flattered by all, you know, not only all of you showing up, but all the love you guys have been showing me the last like three weeks on Twitter and every place else. It's a, a little bit embarrassing actually, but um, thank you so very much. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have.